Well, hello, everybody, and a really warm welcome to the latest in the series of Petroc Talks. Um, as always, the Petroc Talks are about the college bringing together uh, a range of exciting um, speakers to talk about interesting topics uh, that we have um, to address that are going to be of interest to all of us uh, across uh, across Devon. And um, one of the things that has struck me uh, with these is the amazing expertise and um, kind of people that we have right on our doorstep within our com communities. And uh, that's um, very much the case with our session today. So our session today um, uh, focuses on uh, space exploration uh, and is entitled Giant Leap, what's the next step for space exploration? And as I say, we've got four um, great speakers uh, for you today. Three who you see on screen, one who is um, battling home, I think, to get connected to the uh, internet. Um, the first of our speakers, and they'll speak in uh, this order, is Joe Richardson. Joe is Space Ambassador and Outreach Educators for Space Detectives, as well as being a fellow of the Royal Ast Astronomical Society. Um, welcome, Joe. And uh, our second speaker will be uh, Katrina, Katrina Monroe. Katrina is Sustainable Economy Officer and lead for the Dark Skies Reserve in the Exmoor National Park Authority. Um, third speaker uh, is uh, one of our very own uh, experts and I think uh, astronomy enthusiast at Petroc, uh, Dave Waters. Dave is a, a lecturer in physics uh, at Petroc. Uh, welcome, Dave. And let's say our final speaker when he arrives is uh, Michael Bentz. Michael is an A-level student with us at Petro as well. So uh, without further ado, I will get uh, get started. And uh, our first speaker, Joe, over to you. Oh, right. Thank you very much, Sean. And thank you to Petro for uh, inviting me uh, to this really exciting and very topical uh, evening. I am just going to share my screen. Uh, so I have prepared a sort of presentation. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Just let me know that you can, Sean. Can uh, you see that yet? Sounds like a couple of seconds. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, yeah, so a bit of an introduction to me, first of all. Um, as Sean says, my name is Joe Richardson. I am a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and I am the owner and founder of the Southwest based company called Space Detectives. And for my sins, I spend most of my time inspiring young children, um, primary age children mostly, uh, in the science of space exploration. Uh, in 2015, I was very honoured to be uh, asked by the European Space Education Office, which is funded by ESA directly and the UK Space Agency, to become one of the six space ambassadors working on behalf of ESA here in the UK. And in that particular role, as you can see there on the screen, I get to hang out periodically with some very famous astronauts, namely Mr. Tim Peake. So I've spent several years working on something called the Tim Peake Primary Project. So that is literally my full-time job. And um, I, as you hopefully will uh, gather from this presentation, I absolutely love everything to do with space exploration. So when I was asked to do this particular presentation, um, the brief I was given was to actually discuss current and future space exploration. So that is my title slide. And quite often when I'm doing talks, whether it's for adult groups or indeed sometimes children in school, um, one of the questions I often get asked is, well, why do we bother? Why do we bother with exploring space at all? It costs a lot of money you know, surely that money would be better spent elsewhere uh, here on Earth. And uh, in order to answer that question, we have to look really uh, to, to ourselves. And, and I love the quote here from uh, the very last astronaut that ever set foot on the moon, Mr. Gene Cernan, because he said, curiosity is the essence of human existence. And, and that is essentially the reason why, as a species, we've always been curious. We've always been curious to explore and discover the things that we don't know. And that includes obviously the mysteries of the universe. It is something that we're programmed 
to do. And actually, in my own opinion, um, we, we should bother. We should bother exploring space. Um, it enables us to understand more uh, about our universe. It helps us to advance our lives. And in many ways, we actually don't realize we're actually using the uh, technology and the advances that we've gained from space, space in our everyday existence. So um, if I take us right back, um, it's, it's a long time, uh, <laughs> over 50 years ago, uh, if we go right back to the Apollo missions, so the, the very missions that took the first uh, humans to the moon. And even in the late 50s and early 60s, we were literally pushing the boundaries into understanding what was possible. Could humans actually survive space? Could we develop the technology to enable missions to go to the moon to happen? And was it even possible? So those were the questions that were asked in the late 50s, 60s, and obviously the early 70s. But I just want to, to draw your attention to the Apollo rocket as well itself, the Saturn V rocket. Um, up until recently, this particular rocket was the largest ever rocket produced by humans. And yet the technology in that rocket was less than there is in a mobile phone today. So it's actually quite incredible that in technology terms, we had less technology in the Saturn V enabling us to go 240,000 miles across space uh, with astronauts on board to visit the moon. So, you know, 50 years ago, we thought it was possible. And that's led on to so many different advances in technology. Uh, if we look at the International Space Station, the largest man-made object ever built off the Earth. This structure has been orbiting the Earth, believe it or not, for 21 years. Um, it is a, an incredible piece of, of spacecraft, piece of equipment. And astronauts are working on there on, on a daily basis, doing experiments that directly not only explore space, actually help us uh, here on Earth. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later on. Just to give you a few facts and figures about the ISS, it travels at 17 and a half thousand miles per hour. And it's actually literally only about 250 miles up uh, above the Earth. But as I say, it's, it's a huge advance in technology. But if we think about it, it's fairly old technology now, a, a 21 year uh, lifespan. So what else have we done? So in terms of space exploration, well, we're pushing the boundaries with satellites orbiting the Earth. Uh, currently at the moment, there's approximately 4,000 satellites uh, going around us, helping us with things such as agriculture, climate, meteorology, um, you name it, sat-nav, uh, who can do without sat-nav? Um, obviously, all this technology and this sort of technology is advancing all the time. We've also managed to put many a robotic mission on uh, various planets, particularly Mars here. So this is Curiosity on Mars. Um, and we're, we've actually visited pretty much every planetary body in our entire solar system neighborhood, including asteroids as well as planets, obviously as well as moons. So, you know, we've pushed the boundaries. Since Saturn V, we've been pushing all the time. Um, who can forget? the very famous um, spacecraft. In fact, actually, I think probably one of the most um, successful missions in the last sort of 20 years was the Cassini mission to Saturn. We actually sent this probe, it, it landed a, a smaller probe called the Huygens probe onto Titan. And we've learned so much about the gas giants from doing missions such as this one. Obviously, the Hubble telescope uh, went up into space in the early 1990s, and the views that the Hubble has given us over the past uh, years and decades has been phenomenal. We now understand much more about the cosmos from the pictures and images that this particular telescope has actually managed to take. And we would not uh, have a space exploration talk without uh, the latest uh, technology. Here is the latest telescope that was launched Christmas Day uh, this year. 
or should I say last year. Um, in fact, I had to hang on with my Christmas dinner, uh, wasn't allowed to have that, had to hide behind the sofa because this particular telescope, the James Webb telescope, has been a long time in the making and launching. But successful news, it's now at over a million miles from the Earth on the opposite side of the moon uh, at a place that we call Lagrange 2, uh, which is a very stable part of the um, an orbiting area around the, the Earth. And uh, hopefully within the next couple of months, we'll get some super amazing images, uh, which hopefully will probably supersede a lot of what the Hubble has already given us. It's going to enable us to look much, much further back in time and image things that previously that we couldn't image. So amazing technology. So we've come so much further so much further than the Saturn V rocket on its way to the moon. We're now developing new rockets, such as this one here on the right-hand side. This is the Starship, SpaceX Starship. Um, and this is the rocket that takes over from uh, the badge of being the largest rocket ever built. Just to give you an idea of scale, that particular rocket there on the launch pad, and look at the little cars down here to the left. This rocket here will take at least 100 astronauts, 100 civilians, uh, and hopefully, uh, certainly in the next sort of 10 to 20 years, that's the promise uh, from SpaceX themselves, of actually landing humans on another planet, i.e. Mars. So this is our Martian rocket. And the difference between these two rockets is obviously incredible in terms of technology, but the SpaceX Starship is largely a reusable and a much more sustainable rocket. So we can reuse most of the parts uh, that this rocket is made up from. So I am going to sort of end my uh, fairly short talk on um, examples of how space exploration benefits us because we've we've seen how we've advanced in such technology but actually a lot of what we discover when we're exploring space directly helps us here on earth so on the screen here on the top left you've got uh, water filtration systems in third world countries came as a direct result of having to have a short filtration system on the International Space Station. We literally filter um, astronauts' urine in order to make it drinkable because there is no running water on the space station at all. So that technology um, enables us to develop it in third world countries where there are droughts or famine and so forth. So that's hugely important. A lot of the robotics that are used in space, not only on other planets like Mars, but also robotic arms that was uh, or were on the space shuttle uh, back in the early 1990s have been developed and advanced for use in surgery. So in a medical application. And there you can see that on the top right. Similarly, a lot of the scanning machinery that we currently use in hospitals today, including some of the really high tech breast scanners and uh, CT scanners, um, came as a direct result of using scanning applications in the course of space exploration. And probably one of the most important ones on this screen and, and probably the most topical as well, um, a lot of vaccines that we currently have in, in the world were uh, developed and um, tested, if you like, up in space um, as part of experiments done on the ISS, but also um, in the technology in order to actually uh, develop and improve them. So a lot of what we do in space currently, uh, as I say, has huge, huge implications and benefits to us directly here on Earth. So if you're interested, and want to know more, uh, unbelievably, there's lots of ways you can find out more about space exploration, more about astronomy, get more involved. So I would always suggest that perhaps a local astronomy club is the first place to look if you want to be more involved in uh, space science and so forth. And as I say, uh, to find your local astronomy group, that's a really good link there. The Go Stargazing website has a list of all the local astronomy groups uh, not only in the southwest, but more nationally as well. Um, obviously, if space is something that interests you, 
uh, perhaps attending a local event. Um, and here I'm going to link in to Exmoor National Park and their, particularly their Dark Skies Festival, uh, which is I'm sort of heavily involved with. Um, but it's a great place to go in order to um, have a go at doing astronomy or go and listen to a talk. Uh, and it runs for two weeks in the middle of October, October towards the end of October. Uh, I won't say too much more about that because Katrina is going to come on uh, in a moment. And then last but not least, uh, please follow me, uh, follow Space Detectives, uh, check me out on Facebook. I'm always putting up the latest space exploration topics on there. And obviously any events that I'm involved in usually get advertised on there as well. And please take a look at the website if you're interested. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, a little bit later on about space science, space exploration, and how far we've come. So I'll leave you with a quote from Elon Musk. Uh, I want to die on Mars, <clears throat> thus not on impact. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. That was fascinating, Joe. Thank you ever so much. Uh, uh, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions for you uh, following that. Um, right. Uh, next speaker is uh, Katrina. Over to you, Katrina. Right. Hello, everybody. I I've, I've, haven't got my camera on at the minute, but I'm um, trying to... Um, win over with the technology so can you hear me okay yes i think we can lovely thank you and could someone uh, share my first slide please bear with us a second they'll just be coming up I think I can't see it myself, but it's no, it's they, they haven't appeared as uh, yet, Katrina. Okay, Katrina, do you want to start? Yes, talking. I was going to say. Is I'll, that going to work? Is that okay? That. And then we'll if, if they yeah if they if they if they come on then they then they come on then we'll be okay. So uh, I, no so yes yeah, so hello everybody yeah my name's uh, Katrina Munro I'm the um, sustainable economy officer with Exmoor National Park um, and one of my roles is overseeing all our dark skies work. Um, as a national park authority, we have uh, particular statutory purposes. Um, which is um, to conserve and enhance the natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage of Exmoor, um, and also to promote the opportunities for the understanding and enjoyment of the special qualities of the uh, National Park. Now, one of like, Exmoor's special qualities is our incredibly dark skies um, and the tranquility and the sense of wonder that they inspire. So it's really important for us as an area, um, especially when we consider tourism, um, to really promote that special quality and appreciate the fact that for most people living in even in um, some of the smaller urban areas, the light pollution levels are so much greater than they are in Exmoor. Um, that so, for example, when they look up at a night sky on a clear night, they might see, yes, they might see 20, 30, 40 stars. But on a clear night on Exmoor, you literally will see thousands of stars. So the whole experience of being under a clear night sky on Exmoor is very different to what people will achieve in other areas of the country. Um, and as such, you know, we're really proud of that. And we, you know, we, we're keen to get more people to really understand and appreciate it. Um, there's two ways um, that we um, celebrate it specifically. Um, the first one is in back in 2011, we became uh, the first designated dark sky reserve um, in Europe. Um, and we were designated by the International Dark Sky Association. And that was in recognition of our really low levels of light pollution and the sort of work and commitment that we showed to protecting our dark skies and also to helping people to understand them and really appreciate them. Um, you know, the pure nature of the fact that you've joined us on this um, this session tonight probably means that you have an interest and you're also um, really appreciative of the, the, the darkness of our skies um, and what they offer. So, yeah, we became a designated dark sky reserve in 2011. And, and since then, we've done a lot of work 
um, which I'll go into just very briefly. Um, but we have a core area, which is our darkest area in theory, and that's surrounded by a buffer zone. And we do have um, some planning um, regulatory um, rules in place that help us in terms of new development but being a national park actually we have very little in the way of new development anyway so unfortunately we don't necessarily have the powers that people think we have to get everyone to turn their lights off or use the right lighting but what we try and use is our influence to influence the residents and influence the businesses to turn their lights off or to install the right sort of lighting um, and if you go to our website you'll find um, a document called the um, Towards a Dark Sky Standard and that's something that we share with residents and parish councillors to try and encourage them to ensure that their areas um, they're doing whatever they can to preserve our special dark skies. Um, now every year, I, I think it's been going on for several years, the countryside charity called the CPRE, they do an annual star count and it's really important for us as an area where we're constantly looking for publicity for our dark skies um, to try and engage residents and visitors in counting um, the number of stars that can be seen in our sky so it can be com compared with the rest of the country. Um, and as, um, as anyone living wherever you are, whether you're on Exmoor or surrounding Exmoor or further afield, you can take part. Um, so, um, and I encourage you to do so, it's really straightforward. Between the 26th of February, and the, and the 6th of March, so sorry, 26th of February, 6th of March, simply go out on a clear night, find Orion, and count how many stars you can see within the four corner stars of Orion. And literally, you submit that online to the CPRE, um, and they will then sort of um, disseminate everything onto a lovely map, and that every year shows just how dark our skies are because the people on Exmoor can probably see 30 plus stars within that special section of Orion whereas in other areas they maybe see two and three and it really helps to put Exmoor on their map and again it gives us gives us more publicity so something to look out for and literally just google um, CPRE star count and you'll get all the details but it's really straightforward and just a last bit of fun as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been developing some really good resources over the years. Um, we've got a, a Dark Skies, um, Exmoor National Park Dark Skies Pocket Guide, which is a free guide. Uh, we've got a book which has written, been written by astronomer Seb Jay. Um, they're both available through our national park centres. Um, and the other thing that a lot of people don't realise is that you can also hire telescopes through our national park centres. It's not expensive. It's about it's a, it's a very substantial telescope. Um, it comes with a little video uh, that's on YouTube that shows you how to use it, and there's some nice straightforward instructions. Um, I don't suggest it's perhaps suitable for one person to go out, but if there's a few of you or a family, then you know I know families have had really good fun with it, um, and it costs I think it's twenty five pounds for a night, and you pay a refundable deposit. Uh, um, but yeah, we have a telescope at each of our national park centres. That's one in Dulverton, one in um, Dunster and one in Lynmouth. So you can phone ahead and book it. And if you if the skies aren't clear, then you can keep it for another night or you can take up, you know, you don't have to pay again. You can keep it for another night, another time. So um, worth bearing in mind and just quite an exciting little thing to give a try to. Another resource that we have that Joe kindly wrote for us a couple of years ago, just before lockdown, um, is a free downloadable astronomer's guide to Exmoor. Um, what we decided um, people, or what we realised people really wanted to know is where, do, you know, where they were saying, where, would, where do I go on Exmoor? Where do I go for stargazing? Um, and you know basically the message we try and give is well actually you can actually go anywhere you know if you're not in a village if you're out anywhere within the national park the skies are going to be pretty as, as dark as you're going to expect in anywhere in the country um, and you'll get a magnificent view of the night sky but especially if you're slightly more into astronomy um, then other things are going to be slightly more important so there's a measurement called the Bortle scale, which Jo mentions in her guide about her favourite areas. And she mentions what the Bortle scale of light pollution is there. Um, but she also talks as well, which is very interesting for, for astronomers, about what um, degree of the night sky you will see. So in some of them, you will have a, you know, the prime might be 360 degrees. So all around you, you will be able to see the night sky because the horizons are so low. 
and depending on what sort of astronomy you're looking to do or whether you're looking to do some deep sky observations or whether you're looking to do astrophotography the sort of location that you go to might be key so all that information is in a guide that joe has written for us which is really actually easy to understand um, for all levels of people but it will give you you know a really good insight to information um, and that's available from our stargazing web page. So literally at any stage, if you want, if you just Google Exmoor National Park or Exmoor Stargazing, it will take you straight to our stargazing page. And all the things I've just mentioned, like the telescope hire and Joe's guide are all available from that web page. So um, I do urge you to have a look at that. And, and if you want to come to Exmoor, you'll be like, actually, yeah, I'm going to go there because Joe said that's a really great place for doing some constellation spotting. Um, and that's a really good place to start for everybody. So in addition to obviously those resources which are available all year round, as Joe mentioned, we run the Dark Skies Festival, which we've run since 2017. Um, and what we now have is um, this year in particular, it's running from the 13th of October till the 30th of October. Um, we will probably have around up to 50 events taking place all over the National Park. Um, some of them are run by us as the National Park Authority. Some of the events Joe works with us on um, some of them are run by other organisations and some are run by businesses. But the idea is that they're something for everyone. So there might be indoor planetarium sessions because we have a, well, depending on COVID, we have a mobile planetarium that we bring to um, Dunster Tithe Barn, for example. And we will be doing that again this year if we're allowed. Um, but there's also, you know, stargazing experiences with astronomers. Um, there's things that celebrate the night sky and celebrate nocturnal wildlife. Um, and there's things that involve food because everyone loves a bit of food with their stargazing. So something for everyone. And we have um, the last couple of years and is due to come again, a professor, Roger Davies from Oxford University, who's an astrophysicist and cosmologist um, and really eminent in his field. He's come the last couple of years and gives some um, great talks, some family based talks, but also some really in depth astronomy talks, which if you're especially if you're a student of um, astronomy and astrophysics, you know, you'll be you know you need to try and get to go and see him because he's really up there with the top people and you know and he loves a question and answer session from people who are as inspired and as influenced as he is by um, the night skies so yeah there's always lots to look out for and and we get the program up and on the internet as soon as we can but it is developed over the course of the summer um, but yes something to keep an eye out for so in addition to the festival though um, as a tourism area, we've always said to people, actually, it's not just about what we do during the festival. Come at any time of year and you can experience great dark skies. Um, again, people often say, you know, well, where do I go or what can I do? Or they want to have they want to have a, someone to help them to get the most from their experience. So one of the schemes that we've developed is working with tourism businesses to give them some training, which is delivered by Joe. Um, and we give the uh, business owners training in some simple constellation spotting and naming, um, some simple uh, instructions to help people um, to know when to go out or what time of day or how to look at what the moon phase is doing and how that might influence their decisions about when to try and start a phase. Um, so our dark sky friendly um, accreditation scheme now features about 20 businesses and we'll have another, another 10 businesses at least on board this year. Um, a lot of them have telescopes and binoculars and they have flasks of hot chocolate and blankets they can lend you. Um, so especially if you are out of the area and you're thinking, I want to go to Exmoor, I want to go stargazing, they're a really good place to start if you're looking for where can I stay. Um, one of the dark sky friendly businesses is an experience provider um, and they're a business called Wild About Exmoor. And that's run by a, a couple called uh, Jenny and Malcolm. They are... Um, fairly new to astronomy um, compared to a lot of people, but have just really just fallen in love with stargazing and can now div deliver a really good stargazing experience for uh, the general public. So they have they can tailor their experiences according to what people want, but they can take you out up to Dunkley Beacon and you have a walk and then you stay and do some stargazing. They can teach you how to use apps to go stargazing. Um, but they also run intern inside events um, in association with the Exford Bridge Tea Rooms, where they give an indoor planetarium um, sort of type presentation and then go out and do some stargazing afterwards. And they also have some food. So there's a really good variety there 
all year round for visitors and for residents to go and um, explore the night skies. Again, that information is all available on our stargazing webpage. So um, look out for that Dark Sky Discovery Hub. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is um, a Dark Sky Discovery Trail, which we launched at the um, in autumn of last year. Um, and basically, it's a short walk that is as safe as anything to be done at night. So it's on fairly flat terrain. Um, and as long as you have a you know half reasonable level of fitness, it's so, oh, safe for you to do it. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend that you go out and do it on, on all on your own in the dark, but you, you know you can do. And I know people who have done it. But it certainly, as a family experience or with a group of friends, um, it's basically a two mile walk. Um, it's there's way markers, um, and the way markers have got a luminous paint, which have got a little star and some a moon on, so you know you're going the right way. Um, and it's a two mile sort of there and back route, which will take you out onto open moorland um, where you will be truly immersed in under the dark skies. You will have 360 degree views of the dark skies. If you have a clear night, brilliant. If you don't have a clear night, it's still going to be a really immersive experience because you're out there basically in the middle of nowhere. You can hear the wind. You can hear the uh, wildlife. There's um, potentially ponies around there. There's sometimes cattle around there. Um, we've heard bats. We've heard beetles uh, screeching in the night. Um, so it's a really great, exciting experience. And it's like a mini adventure. Um, but so, yeah, we recommend you look into that. Um, and again, you'll find details of that by going to our Stargazing webpage. Um, and there's also a link to a website, which is exmorewalks.org. Um, where we also have a, a short film showing people doing the walk at night and talking about the sort of experience and the sort of sights that you can see. So um, I do recommend you do that. There is a short um, guide available from our national park centres that costs just a pound, um, but you don't need the you don't need the guide, you know, the, the leaflet to do it. You can go out and follow the signs. But yeah, do do investigate further and basically what we want you to do as a national park is for people to come and enjoy that special quality. So. Hopefully I've uh, mentioned enough things to make you want to come and experience it. Um, and, you know, we look forward to seeing you at events or just out and about on the Dark Sky Discovery Trail. I'm done. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Katrina. Sorry that we didn't get your uh, slides up. And, and I have to say, um, as someone who's been up on the moor and laid on my back in the dark with my... Um, family uh, hearing about the fact that you can both hire a telescope and that you've got guided walks across the the moor for nighttime walks is um, I shall certainly be uh, um, following that up myself um over to our next speaker I'm really pleased to uh, uh, be able to hear now from Dave Waters from Patrop Dave over to you hi everyone um yeah so welcome to the talk um so someone asked you why why space is for me is interesting uh one thing I would say is personally for me is it's still very much a live science sometimes very much you know it's still research but not really alive in that sense and we can see it happening every day day in day out and um for me space is still very much alive in that sense that it's still very new to us in some aspects um and there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of, as you know about space in you know in, in our lives really okay so we know a little bit about what's out there but compared to the size of the universe uh, it's growing every day we still don't know much about it at all. And I think that's quite amazing, really, the fact that we still know very little about what's out there in our, you know, in our science and if you're, in that nowadays, nowadays in, our, in our lives. We're still unsure what's actually out there in full detail. So it's still very much a living science, and and with students in the classroom as well, that's really important to get them engaged in the science and engaged in in the physics of the of the uh, space and technology. Um, it really is that engagement they really like to be involved with, you know. So um, that's why I like it so much, you know, we, we still got to learn so much more about it. In regards to teaching it in, in physics at A-level and obviously in schools, um, the students actually see it happening as well. Um, you know, every, if we go to Saturday night, night sky, we see the, 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 the stars at night, we see the moon at night, and we can see it actually there in front of us, which in science is really important. We can't see a lot of science sometimes happening in our lives every day. You know, we know it's there. We see things work and we can't, we can't just see it there at that point. So to see it in, in, you know, in, our, in, our, in our lives every day is really important for us. And the students can really see that happening 
in their lives. They can see it changing in their lives, you know, with stars and planets being being found and being discovered, you know, through every year. Um, and that's really important that the students feel part of that journey through their learning um, and through their space as well. So I think it's really a, a package deal, really, that they get that sort of engagement of what's happening in, in, at this moment in time with their discoveries and feel part of that learning curve as well, in a sense that, you know, some science doesn't really, doesn't really show that very, very clearly, but I think space does show that quite clearly, how things are changing every day in their lives as well. Um, and every student I've talked to says that that's the best part of their sort of physics learning is that astronomy and space, you know, learning in, in the classroom. Um, a, it's exciting, you know, and it, from the start to finish, they see where they came from, how things start, how things formed. But also they know that there's still more to come in their lifetime. They're going to obviously find more planets. They're going to find more uh, stars out there. And they're going to find out more about how we actually began the Big Bang and stuff like that. So they can see how their sort of like lives will actually have science changing throughout it. You know, some science is obviously set in its way already. We can't change many laws in our you know science we've got. But with space, we're still trying to find new laws and new theories and new aspects um, which is obviously very exciting for them to go into. Um, and it sort of makes them want to actually develop into scientists in that area to actually make them actually want to develop and become astronomists or become, you know, part of that astronomy world to see how they can change, change the science world themselves. You know, and that's really, really important, I think, going forward for our, um, for our space sort of area. Um, so I did university, obviously, uh, University of Cardiff for, for four years, Masters. And in that time, we did a lot of uh, uh, universe stuff, very much the like exoplanets and planet, planetary motion. Um, so basically looking at laws of, of space, space time, Einstein's theory of relativity, that sort of stuff there. Um, and I just find it very intriguing, you know. And, and you find out so many laws that actually don't actually fit on Earth, but in space they actually fit quite nicely. And that's quite mind-boggling for some people. Um, but I find that fascinating how, how things can, in space can be different to what we have actually on Earth here. So that's why I, I've went into the field of, of space very much. And um, hopefully I'll, I'll continue to enthuse, uh, enthuse students in their lives, hopefully, at A-level and obviously other levels as well. Um, but also young young students too also think you know space they can see happening as well that you know every 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 young child in their life will know what the sun is and know what planets are and know what earth is so it's sort of something that can start at a very young age as well which I means teaching is very important because although a level is very in depth looking at the space side of it with younger younger students as well they can still access it very easily so it's almost making that science for young students in you know in like preschool and junior school still very much part of their of their life so they feel involved with that as well so for me it's about seeing the whole thing there is that you can, you can start at a very young age and then grow up as you get older learn more about it in their sort of like education and their progression through science and and college so that's why i love it and that's why i'm teaching it and that's why hopefully i'll be able to make many more students happy and enthused in the uh, line of space and astronomy fantastic thank you dave and uh yeah i know uh, a number of your students are i do really love that bit of the the work that you do um right uh, opportunity now uh, for you to ask uh, some of our um speakers any questions if you're watching on youtube then you can input your questions and they'll appear um on my screen just here and i've, I've got a, a list of some here as well so just starting uh off just to get a, a sense from um uh, any of the speakers um picking one what can we expect by 2050 what will we be doing in space by then um joe do you want to go first Okay, so <laughs> yes, um, 2050 it seems a long way away, doesn't it? But actually, it'll come around very quickly. It depends really who you 
speak to. Um, there are lots of missions on the cards um, if you're working for NASA. Uh, NASA have this big um, ambition to return to the moon. Um, it was meant to be happening in 2024, but it's been pushed back now to 2026. And the idea is that NASA would like to use the moon as a stepping stone, uh, if you like, for further exploration, uh, sending humans to, to Mars. Uh, so that's NASA's sort of plans. But then if you go over to the private sector, so we're looking at people such as uh, particularly uh, Elon Musk, he's um, basically said that he will have humans on Mars within the next 10 to 15 years. Now, however, how uh, is that possible? Is that possible? Um, the weakest link in uh, humans going to Mars is the human themselves. Uh, because space is exceptionally dangerous to humans. Uh, we don't get on too well with microgravity. It tends to waste our muscles and bones quite readily. And we also have a huge issue with radiation uh, emanating from space itself, but also obviously from our uh, nearest star, the sun. So um, yeah, it depends, as, as I say, which side of the fence you're on, uh, whether you back the private sector, uh, uh, getting people directly to Mars, or whether you back the governmental agencies... Um, NASA, for example, going uh, to the moon or returning back to the moon uh, before going to Mars. So, yeah, who knows? Um, it, it, it's exciting. And as Dave said, it is, you know, all of that sort of stuff is is hugely inspirational, not just to children and students, but also to, to adults as well. Absolutely. Um, Dave, come to you next. Uh, what do you think we'll see 2050? Um. Good question. Um, obviously, as uh, Joe said, there's so much changing very quickly now. Um, not really sure, personally. Hopefully, we're going to find more about, about the Big Bang. That's my interest. I love how we actually started the Big Bang. Um, obviously, we learn more about that every day now as, as science develops. Um, so hopefully, I'd like to see by that time, know more about how actually we formed the Big Bang, what actually happened at the Big Bang in more detail. And maybe, you know, maybe we'll try and understand how it was caused, maybe. I hopefully I don't know. You know, that is my interest in that area there. So hopefully we'll know more about that maybe at some point in the in the future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Um, what would you what would you, what do you think we'll see by twenty fifty, or what would you like to see in relation to space? I'm so oh, I sorry. Whether... I'm getting very oh, bad no, I've got you. at the minute. We've we, we've got you, uh, uh, Katrina. I'm sorry, I can't really hear it. Oh, okay. Um, I I'll have another go. Um, if uh, what do you think you can expect by 2050 in relation to space, or what would you like to see? Dave and Joe, yes, you're going to so get an awful lot of questions. I think I think it's best if we abandon me answering questions and Joe can quite happily answer on behalf of Exmoor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, but, uh, just just as a, a kind of from me then a supplementary for the uh, two of you, I wondered um, with kind of the whole idea of kind of micro satellites and kind of small scale um, rockets. Do you think space is going to be democratized in the next? Um, period, or will the billionaires of Elon Musk and others dominate the future of space exploration? Um, Joe, gosh, that's that's a tough one. Um, I think personally, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of, of satellite technology. Um, a lot of private industries are already involved in that, um, even now. So, you know, even from the UK, we currently have uh, two particular spaceports uh, that are in development and uh, the Cornish spaceport, which is at Newquay, um, uh, part of Newquay Airport, it will become Cornwall Spaceport. Um, they are going to, later on this year, be launching some of the very first satellites on board rockets from Cornwall. So I think personally, um, sort of the satellite technology uh, and that sort of stuff is, is very much going to remain part of private industry. 
the space exploration in terms of going out towards the moon, going out to Mars, I think it will be um, between the two. But maybe over time, I, you know, governments don't particularly fund space very well. Um, and I think as we go forward, it, it probably will become more of a private private industry driven um, thing. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I, I don't really know. I think quite often private industry can inspire a lot. You know, they've got money to, to throw at it. And I think they can actually inspire some of the governmental and countries like um, China, India, all of the countries around the world uh, that are involved in space and space exploration. So I think, yeah, it's a difficult question that. <laughs> Dave, your thoughts? I'm not too sure, really. Same as Joe. Um, um, I think, you know, it's potentially it could happen, but I, I, I would hope that it remains very much as it is, you know, now very much for research purposes um, for everything else, really. I think, you know, if it, if it stays in that research area, um, then it's good for all of us involved with science and technology, um, you know, and, and, you know, if it, if it goes the other way, it might be a bit not as, you know, a bit bad for us maybe so hopefully it will stay if it does go towards that sort of industry and in, in that sort of like area it still remains very much based on research what i would hope for really um in the future but as i say very tough questions to answer I think, at this point in time as joe was saying just then thank you um I didn't think it was going to be long before I got beyond my uh, the limits of my understanding of things. There's a couple of questions in here that I'm um, I don't quite understand, but and one of them, which um, I understand the question, if not the answer, a question from Craig here: um, Why do we get a high tide with a full moon? Who wants to answer that? I, I can I can answer that if you want. Go on, then. Go on then, so. Go. Full, a full moon uh, means, I mean, if when the moon is a full moon, it's literally on the opposite side of the Earth to the sun, okay? Because that's why the moon has no light of its own. It merely reflects light from the sun. So you get high tides uh, when that happens because of the gravitational pull of both the moon on the Earth, uh, albeit a small pull from the moon on the Earth, um, in conjunction with the sun. And uh, that gravitational pull actually stretches the Earth um, and stretches everyone on it as well, um, ever so slightly. And when you stretch the Earth, the water that sits on the top layer or the, the crust of the Earth's surface literally sloshes around. Um, and so it's literally the gravitational pull of the full moon um, because it's on the opposite side uh, to the sun. And so they're working in conjunction. They stretch the Earth quite um, a lot more than when the, uh, the moon is in, in different positions. Well, fascinating. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for that uh, question. And this coming back to, I guess, why we should prioritize space. Uh, there's a, a, a question here from Sue uh, saying, you know, there's the amount of money that's being spent on the, the, um, the SpaceX program. Um, you know, why spend it on that rather than tackling world hunger, for instance? Dave. Um, I think if you don't know more about what's out in space and what's out in the you know the universe, I think it could help us with things on Earth in the long run. So, for example, with development in vaccines of sort as it is now, and development in in sort of that technology in space and that, that's helping us understand how we formed in the first place, what formed the Earth and what formed planets and what formed you know us as we are today. So if you understand those sort of level of, of in that detail as how we formed at the beginning, it could help us solve a lot of problems on Earth that we have right now, um, you know, in the long run. So I think it's, it, it might seem, you know, silly right now to send money on that when that's on the Earth, but I think in, in the long term, it could benefit us um, massively in the future by understanding those, those, those fundamental things at the beginning and seeing how we actually helped us to understand how we form, how we, how we are living now even, you know, how are we staying alive now in our universe, in our solar system. I understand those things are really important for us to actually, you know, continue our life and continue having a better life in the future, potentially. So I think that's probably what I would say for 
why it's important to continue research um, in, in all areas of, of space and astronomy. Okay, so that's... Can, uh, can, I, can I just add, yeah, no, I was going to say, I was just going to add to that. Um, actually, there's a great myth that people think that there's actually, you know, lots and lots and lots of money spent on space science and space exploration. Actually, that's a quite a, quite a big myth. Um, in, in fact, we actually spend more uh, per uh, capita, per, per head of population on war and um, funding the military. Uh, around the world so you know I always feel a little bit aggrieved when people sort of ask that question because actually why pick on space why pick on the very science that actually helps us directly on earth um, when we should maybe be thinking and, and focusing our sort of uh, displeasure if you like on on other things that actually cost more such as wars around the world and, and, and you know, furnishing countries with military um, weapons and so forth. Is, is space going to become the next place that wars are for? <laughs> um, well, so it's a space force. Is this, is this a, a direct link to the US and their space force? Well, hopefully not. Um, at the moment, space is the very place where internationally all countries pretty much work together. And a great example of that is the International Space Station. So we have, believe it or not, the Russian cosmonauts uh, working in direct, um, you know, liaison with the Europeans and the Americans and the Canadians and everyone else who's up there on the space station. So, you know, it's the one place at the moment uh, where internationally we all manage to, to uh, cooperate and collaborate. And, and long may that continue. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> No, okay, okay. A, a slightly a kind of different question in uh, here about actually kind of looking up at, um, at space. What's the what's the most amazing thing that either of you have seen um, in space from your if you've been looking at uh, planets or constellations or what? What's the because um, I was really quite excited by the prospect of going up to Exmoor and you know being able to with my family take a borrow a decent telescope some instructions on how to use it and then go and actually see something. Um, what, what's the most amazing thing that you've seen? Uh, Dave? So me, me first, yeah. Okay, so I think the best thing, well, it wasn't if there's more, it wasn't there now really, it was, it, was a, it was a really clear night on Exmoor, fair enough, and we're driving home from somewhere and we pulled over and just, you know, scarred the car and you could just see, you know, from, so, from one side to the other, just, just these, stars everywhere there wasn't you know it wasn't there was pretty much star everywhere it was a star and the closer you look you can see more stars behind it and then you can see more and, and because you see more so the more you can look into that that space you can see more stars in different layers of stars going back and it was an incredible you know sight to see and i think i know it wasn't really anything we don't, we don't you know, you know nothing new we don't really know but it was still that that thing of actually wow you know this is a massive thing above us, above us we can see and the feeling of seeing you know, what's actually out there further than that, you know, because see all these layers of stars beyond star, beyond star, getting smaller and dimmer as you go back. And that a feeling of just amazement and just, you know, inspirational feeling of thinking, wow, you know, what is actually beyond that? And it's that, that's what really got me interested in sort of like looking into it further, really, going back many years ago now. Um, just an incredible, incredible feeling. So that's one of my most memorable thing about space, really, that was that feeling of thinking, you know, what else is out there? Because see that, that far in detail but what's beyond that and what's beyond fur from those layers back from those what we can see already fantastic thank you dave joe you must have spent quite a bit of time um looking up and seeing things what's, what's I, i've got know? am i allowed am i allowed three go on then give us three give us three <laughs> so i'll give you the very earliest one so right. the earliest one so was when i was a one. child and i witnessed or saw uh, observed saturn for the very first time through a telescope okay that is uh, literally what got me hooked so i could see the uh, the planet and i could see its rings and i honestly thought someone had stuck a picture on the lens of the telescope i couldn't quite believe that what i was seeing was real okay so that was the first thing that inspired me uh, the second thing that I remember seeing and thinking, oh, my goodness, that's a wow, was the aurora. So the northern lights, which uh, I managed to witness in 2019. 
uh, just phenomenal. Uh, made me feel very insignificant, but also quite significant being part of this planet. And then the third thing, I'm agreeing with Dave here, um, actually on Exmoor, in a very spe specific spot on Exmoor called Winsford Hill, uh, in the middle of a summer evening where obviously it had gone dark, it was nice and warm, and I led on a picnic blanket and I looked up and I saw the Milky Way stretching across the actual sky. And again, it was like Dave, it was just like, wow, that is our galaxy. And here I am on Exmoor looking in towards the centre of it. Amazing. That's, I, I bet there's a number of people that can't wait to get... Um up onto x i wouldn't recommend you do it tomorrow uh, but soon maybe saturday we we might be able to get there um i can take the the opportunity i'm really pleased to say um to uh, introduce our um uh, our last speaker uh, on the day um michael uh, michael bence is a a level student in uh at petrock and studying physics chemistry and biology he tends to go on to study electrical engineering um i think michael uh Welcome. Hopefully you can hear us, Michael. And yeah, I, hello. Um, hiya. I just want to ask you, Michael, we're talking about what kind of, why does space inspire us? And I wonder whether you could um, give us your take on that. You know, why I'm, are you inspired by space? I'm inspired by space because space is, we, we, learn, we know so little about it. And I think the more things we can learn about space is, um, the more things we can we can take from that and we can use to develop our own society. Okay, no, that's that, that's fantastic. And I, um, a, a question both for you, but also for our um, other speakers. Um, I'm thinking, what business opportunities are there going to be that arise from space exploration? I guess both process of putting things up into space but perhaps then the things that you can do with the satellites or other things that you've put up there and so you know if you want to become a um an on a space entrepreneur you know where would you start that's something uh, at petro we encourage our learners to think about creating their own um, businesses their own organizations you know making change happen themselves um if you're going to do that with space you know you know how do you get started um uh Joe first, and then uh, I'll come to uh, Dave. Then to you, Michael, to about what you um, you know what you would like to see in terms of your um, future employment. Joe. So um, I mean that's that's not a very uh, that's a not an untrue statement because the UK space industry is the fastest growing industry that we have. Um, and actually, when we think about the future, a lot of the jobs that will become available. Um, actually haven't even yet been invented because space and, and exploration of space is constantly changing, evolving, um, new technology and so forth. Um, if I was to um, suggest how to start um, in the space industry, it would certainly to be have an, have an interest in space to start with, uh, maybe go down the route of uh, studying physics uh, and maths um, and, um, you know, just literally keep your options open because as I say um, some of the jobs that will become available in the next 10 20 years um, have not even yet been invented there is so much that you could do I mean unbelievably you can even be a space librarian or um, a space lawyer um, there's you know and there's going to be more cool certainly for for the sort of um uh the 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 sort of um what's the word laws of space especially yeah. when private industry becomes more involved definitely no fascinating dave um what do you think the business opportunities are from space um i think about making it more sustainable really would be a good point really uh, you know we have so much up there that's been wasted over the years in satellite terms or de de debris terms um, and find a way to make that sort of debris and, and waste sort of useful up in space to be really a good way forward. So if someone could f find out how to make, you know, um, dead satellites become useful in space somehow, you know, making it more sustainable, making it more cost effective up in space. That would be, I think, a good way forward for for us to uh, reset also for making things more useful up in up in the universe. So 
that's my view on on uh, on on so, things. So, so, so we, I kind of a Dyson for for space debris could um, make some yeah, awful it, lot yeah. of money. I guess it, definitely, yeah, definitely. That's the way forward. I think in the future. Okay, um, coming to you, Michael. I guess that you're um, you've got your um, uh, career ahead of you in this. You know, what what would be your ideal space related job? Do you think? How would you? Where where do you want to um, take your career? Well, I'd certainly like be interested in the electronics of, um, just, for example, spacecraft and power systems of satellites and things. Um, in particular, uh, it would be a great opportunity to work on some of the different satellites for companies private companies like SpaceX, which um, deliver payloads to the International Space Station. Um, and besides that, I'm also quite interested in um, satellites here on Earth, which are looking into distant galaxies. And electronics play, plays a fundamental part in that because it's all about how to transfer the data of, for example, light from distant galaxies. and how you can put that into, say, a computer or something and then analyze your results. For example, a prime example of this is um, there was a, a group of satellites globally which were um, detecting the first image of a black hole. And it was really interesting about how they were able to use the technology to produce this image using very high complex data. Um, so, so I think in terms of not only just about the power systems and satellites, but how how we can understand more about our own galaxy and our own universe through electronics. Yeah, well, there, it's it sounds like there are some going to be some great opportunities out out there for you and for um, many others. Um, a, a, a plug for one organisation, I think, if people are interested in these sorts of things. Um, if you look up the, the satellite applications catapult, which is an organization dedicated to supporting organizations that are um, uh, see the um, the potential of that space industry um, that's growing. And, you know, and they're supporting, for instance, uh, I know uh, I'm picking up on your point, Dave, about sustainability, um, a project about um, lithium exploration that uh, enables a reduction in the environmental impact and the cost of finding lithium that uses new satellite data from new satellite um, uh, that have been um, put up there too, um, which we can exploit about understanding our world uh, kind of down here. Um, so um, kind of next question um, that we've uh, got here, back to the kind of thinking about some possibilities uh, from uh, the, um, What's the next step for space exploration? You talked about this kind of leapfrogging um, piece potentially with NASA, Joe, and mm -hmm. and the, the, and all the, the the straight thing to Mars. Let, let's move a bit forward, be a bit more ambitious. Once we've got to Mars, we've got a little colony there. Where do we go next? Gosh, so um, well, who knows? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, getting to Mars, as I say, is not going to be an easy feat uh, by any stroke. Um, uh, the weakest link in that chain is is the human uh, body um, because we don't do space very well. Maybe uh, with the James, the introduction of the James Webb Telescope, maybe the space exploration that we need to then look at is maybe um, remotely imaging um, the um, exoplanets you know uh, so these are planetary systems that are going around other stars and yes we know a little bit about them now but we don't know an awful lot and as as Dave said you know we know not that much about space unbelievably so using the James Webb particularly that will help us hopefully image uh, some of those uh, worlds, those exoplanetary worlds, and that will help us understand the formation of planets and solar systems um, and so forth. In terms of human exploration, I'm not really sure where we go, if I'm honest, uh, after Mars, as I say, because we are the weakest link, literally, mm -hmm. in any type of space exploration where we send humans. So, yeah, we'd have to have some severe... Uh, some critical science to try and mitigate the risks. Okay, uh, Dave, um, a slightly different question uh, to you. If 
once we get to Mars, do you think they will find life there when we get there? I really hope so. And why? <laughs> I would love to find life on Mars. It'd be brilliant. Um, I'm not really too sure on this answer. I'm not too sure. Um, if there was life there, and the answer to, you know, why is there life there, I don't really know. But you know, I think we're the only planet with, with life on in the universe. I think would be would be quite wrong of us to think that. I think you know why why are we so special to have the only planet in the whole universe to have life? I think it's really you know be really lucky to be like, like that. So I do think there's life out there somewhere. In what form? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure the answer to that question fully. If I'm honest with you right now, but that's one thing. Hopefully, but in the in the coming years and, and you know uh, looking at technology. In that, in the future, uh, research projects, you might try and find. You know, might try and to go into that sort of field and see what life is out there on on other planets in the universe, and maybe start thinking about. You know, if we do find life, what makes life exist as it does? You know, and that's what one thing I, I would be keen to sort of be involved with in researching in the future, definitely. Fantastic, and Michael. Um, you talked about the kind of uh, the electrical engineering kind of opportunities that you see. And so there's a potential career there. Um, do you envisage in your lifetime that you'll travel into space as part of those careers? Um, that's and, very and, interesting. And, 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 what, and, what, and what will your family think about it? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think that comparatively to about 40 years ago, the you know, NASA, I believe, went through a bit of a phase of there was some lack of funding. But I think due to the there's been a lot of encouragement lately um, with the private industries such as SpaceX um, and Boeing, etc. Et and I, I, I believe that with this encouragement, um, there is a good chance that we will get to Mars um, in, in this in this coming decade. And um, I, I think my my family personally would be probably again it was discussed earlier probably more focused on on the planet and you know things like climate change but uh -huh. I, I i definitely see that that the, w this this next ge generation this next hundred years or so will be will be really setting up the foundations of a martian colony um and electronic engineering pays key, key part in that because it will be really important to establish um, communication between earth and mars and in addition to that, um, setting up things like Eli, I think Elon Musk said about setting up a, a Starlink network like here, here on Earth, but for Mars, which will allow um, communications between Earth and Mars to be established over long distances. Uh, and not just about that, I think there'll be a great effort to look at how renewable energy can be used on Mars. Um, for example, Mars is a very dry, um, hot, exposed lots of exposure to the sun in the environment so so it's a great opportunity to utilize so solar energy to in in to support a martian colony wow that's really interesting I, if i can I actually go a bit um further michael the you t you talked about you know people being concerned about um the climate emergency here uh as, as a as a major concern do you think um space colonization is necessary because we may make a mess of the existing planet and we'll need another one to start with i i think it. that's an interesting question i think um what we can learn from climate change is um how to better adapt to our own planet before we colonize other planets and i i'm i'm highly certain we, we will we'll definitely colonize mars but i think um it's a great opportunity to learn how we can sort of control our own energy systems, control carbon capture. I mean, for example, um, I, I, I was actually look, looking and doing some research on this and um, I, was, I was looking into how carbon capture could essentially be used on a Martian environment because um, a high proportion of the the atmosphere on Mars is made up of carbon dioxide. And so if we could somehow figure out a way to produce oxygen from carbon dioxide, then 
would actually provide better conditions for for Martian for Martian habitat. Mm. Um, and I think I think it's I think we'll continue to, to you know that but go down both ventures into research. But I think there's there's a great opportunity to in, in an area that lies between both both issues. And um, guys, to talking about, I think in there there is there are other factors that play um, not just aside climate change. It's really important to um, look for other planets to be habitable. Um, for example, um, there's there's a, a huge there's a there's a risk of um, an, an, any asteroid collisions or space objects. I mean, there's a huge problem that's arised with the amount of space junk that's that's circulating in in the atmosphere. And um, even though it, even though it, it's a real risk because even the smallest mass, say for example, a penny, could because it's got such a great velocity, could cause a lot of damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Joe, um, are you are you hopeful of our tackling the climate emergency, or do you think we're going to need space? Um, are we going to tackle climate emer- the emergency? Well, hopefully we are. Um, but the fact that we we've got orbiting satellites in our own uh, Earth orbit helps us to actually understand the climate better. Uh, and where it's going. So, you know, using satellite technology now to try and combat and and rever- help reverse um, uh, what is what is currently happening. Uh, we only have to look at Venus um, to know what happens to a planet which has a runaway greenhouse gas effect. Because um, essentially, on Venus, uh, that's what's happened. It's got a super thick atmosphere. Uh, it's an incredibly hot planet. Um, and the super uh, pressures that uh, the atmosphere uh, has on Venus w- is enough to crush metal. Um, so, you know, we can learn from learning about other planets on how better to protect our own and to reverse the changes that there are. And so for that, yes, I think space exploration is super important. Whether we would actually Um, invoke a sort of climate emergency on another planet. I'm not so sure, actually. I think if we were to get to Mars, I think the main reason for going to Mars is not necessarily because we've messed up this planet. I think it's because we're running out of resources on this planet. And so, you know, looking to space uh, to to furnish um, ourselves with other resources is is one option. Uh, As I say, I agree with um, Michael. I think... um, you know, we're not being too optimistic that this will definitely happen in the sort of next 10 to 15 years. I think we will see, right. you know, Martian bases and humans living on the surface of Mars without a doubt. Amazing. Right. Final question uh, to all of you. Uh, this uh, kind of hour of it has gone ever so quickly. Um, Joe, when you in your presentation, you talked about the early stages of kind of space exploration and of course the space race. Uh, at the time symbolized i think um hope community um innovation and possibility and so the question for um each of each of you is um what does space exploration symbolize for you today um dave come to you first um i think it's more about Obviously, we know what's out there to an extent, but very little about actually how it works and why it's out there, in a sense. So I think for me, exploration now is more about seeing what's out there, seeing what, what more is out there, but also trying to see, you know, how we can use what's out there to our advantage. You know, and say about living on Mars, people on Mars in a few years' time, you know, 10 to 20 years' time. Um, you know, how can we live on Mars? How can people you know, have a base on Mars to stay there? And that's something I'm you know, really keen to sort of see develop over the next few years now, how we can actually use what's out there on planets, you know, and, and stars and that to our advantage on Earth here, how can we can use that sort of ideas out there on Earth for us to have, you know, for us to, in our lives um, today. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Joe. 
Uh, well, if you think about what's happened in the last 50 years and how we've actually um, transgressed from the Saturn V rocket to where we are now, where we've got more sustainable, um, reusable rocket technology and all the things that we've done in between, which were part of my presentation, what I'm looking forward to is what, what on earth are we going to do in the next 50 years? What's the technology and um, exploration and possibility uh, going to be like uh, then unfortunately I probably won't be here to see it but <laughs> but I'm hoping that I can stick around long enough to see people walking on the surface of Mars or indeed finding life on another planet <laughs> wow and um and finally uh Michael what what does space exploration symbolize for you today uh, it's 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 amazing because it feels like it, it unites the world and we are just this sort of blob in this sea of darkness of what we call space. And um, I think it's sort of just, I can imagine sort of everyone watching that space launch in 1969 and just sort of bringing people together. Um, and I think it, it, it's all about just understanding about the unknown. Um, and that's, that's the incredible interesting thing about, about it is that we, we know so little and that, the more we the more we know little by li little is just it's just such an amazing amazing thing to just take in and understand and i think that space exploration hopefully in the future will you know un unite people people even more to um and build it and it will also i think it will build, build a hopefully build a positive relationship with our planet and the rest of the universe. Well, a really uh, very positive place to end. Thank you ever so much, Michael. And thank you, um, uh, all of you, our speakers uh, today. Uh, thank you, Joe, uh, Dave, to Katrina. Sorry that uh, with the wind that your connection has not worked well. And also to uh, Michael uh, for your contribution too. Um, I hope you will um, join us for the next Petrox Talks. Look out for it on social media. And thank you very much for your questions and for joining us this evening. Thank you. Goodbye.